think we'll start um, at this point. Um, first of all, thank you for joining us this evening. Today, we're going to be talking about naloxone and more specifically how it relates to pharmacy and what the role of pharmacy teams are in recommending naloxone to prevent opioid related deaths. This is a very important topic, as we all know. Naloxone is the most accessible and really relevant form of harm reduction available to us as pharmacists. And it's really a public health issue and one that we all need to be tuned in on. And it's especially timely this month with International Overdose Awareness Day around the corner at the end of the month. So for this evening, I'll be the moderator. And just so everyone's aware, we will be sending out the presentation slides after the event. There will also be a survey, which we will put in the chat box near the end of the presentation for you to fill out to uh, just confirm your email to get the slides and also for your feedback as well. So before we go into the agenda, I'll just take a minute to do some quick introductions. My name is Molly, I'm a pharmacist and I lead the program development here at Whole Health. For those of you who are not familiar with Whole Health, we are an independent pharmacy banner with locations across seven provinces in Canada now. We create clinical practice programs to keep our pharmacies up to date with the latest guidelines and the latest products. And we really focus on uh, creating tools within these programs to facilitate patient care. I'm also joined this evening by our fantastic University of Waterloo Pharmacy student, Mirabella Chan, who has done some amazing work on this program and other initiatives within the banner. And I'll just pass it on to her at this point for her to introduce herself. Thanks, Molly. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Mirabella. And as Molly said, I'm a University of Waterloo Pharmacy student. Uh, I'm doing my third co-op at Whole Health, just coming to the end of it. Um, and I've been working alongside Molly to help bring these programs to fruition. So I am really excited to bring this naloxone campaign and excited to talk to you about it tonight. First, we'd just like to take a moment to thank Emergent Biosolutions for their support in helping us make this webinar possible. So there will be three parts to the webinar tonight. The first part will go over opioid toxicity and how to recognize the signs and symptoms. The second part will go over naloxone, the available formulations, and the recent guideline updates on naloxone for pharmacists. And then finally, we'll go over opportunities for intervention for pharmacy teams, and then we'll leave some time for Q&A afterwards. So first we'll start with opioid toxicity. Throughout this presentation, we'll be using the term opioid toxicity. And you might be thinking, is this the same as opioid overdose? And the answer is yes. However, we avoid using the word overdose because it might be negatively perceived as an event that happens when someone voluntarily takes too much of an illicit opioid rather than the biological response to when our body receives too much of a substance. So using the word overdose adds to the stigma and negative conceptions about opioid use, which is why we use the term opioid toxicity. And some other terms you can use are opioid poisoning, opioid intoxication, and opioid induced respiratory depression when you're speaking to other healthcare professionals. Very important point to make, uh, as Mirabella has said, um, in terms of if we compare this to some of the uh, other language that we use for other substances. For example, for alcohol, we never say alcohol overdose, it's always alcohol poisoning. Um, so saying it in this way makes it more clear as well. Um, so it's important in the language that we use. So we do have a few poll questions during this webinar as well. Um, and just as a reminder, um, the poll questions that we have are completely anonymous. So feel free to tune in. And if you don't see an answer that you agree with on here, um, let me just launch this, then you can feel free to add it to the chat box as well. So for the first question, to orient ourselves on the magnitude of the opioid crisis, how many Canadians die each day from opioid toxicity? We'll just give a couple of seconds. Okay. And we'll end it 
that point. So I'll end it now so you can see the results. So you can see here a little bit across the board. Uh, we do know that it's quite a bit. Um, as for how much, we'll go into that in the next slide. Okay, so based on uh, 2020 studies, uh, so the answer is 17. 17 Canadians die each day from opioid toxicity, and 96% of those are accidental or unintentional. What's interesting also is that up to 33% of annual drug deaths in Ontario are related to prescription opioids. And usually when you think of drug overdoses or opioid toxicity, um, usually you think of people who are misusing illicit drugs. So it is interesting to see that uh, almost a third of drug deaths are related to those with prescriptions. Of course, to no one's surprise, COVID-19 exacerbated the opioid crisis. So from April to December 2020, which was in the height of the pandemic, Canada saw an 89% increase in opioid-related deaths, 23% increase in hospitalizations for opioid-related toxicity, and a 61% increase in EMS responses to suspected opioid-related toxi opioid toxicity. And there uh, are a number of factors that may have contributed to these staggering numbers. So some of the factors might have been the increasingly toxic drug supply, increased feelings of isolation, stress, and anxiety during the pandemic, and limited availability or accessibility of services for people who use drugs. And this map shows the total uh, number of apparent opioid toxicity deaths across Canada in 2020. And as you can see, the highest rates of opioid toxicity deaths were seen in Ontario, BC and Alberta, which make up 85% of all opioid toxicity deaths in Canada in just those three provinces alone. So now that we've talked about the prevalence and how big of an issue opioid toxicity is, let's just take a moment to ask ourselves, what does a person at risk of opioid toxicity look like or what are their characteristics? And I just want you to keep that answer in the back of your mind as we go forward with this presentation. So how exactly does opioid toxicity occur? As we know, opioids are prescribed to help manage acute and chronic pain by inhibiting the release of neurotransmitters that contribute to nociception. And because opioid receptors are located in both the central and peripheral nervous systems, Opioids produce a broad spectrum of adverse effects, such as slowed breathing or respiratory depression, uh, slowed digestion and constipation, nausea and vomiting, and sedation. So when blood levels of opioids become too much for the body to handle, it leads to opioid toxicity and respiratory depression. And if it's not treated immediately, it can unfortunately be fatal. There are three hallmark symptoms of the opioid toxic of opioid toxicity called the opioid toxicity triad. So that's decreased breathing, pinpoint pupils, and decreased level of consciousness. So when you see these three symptoms together, you can almost be certain that what you're seeing is opioid toxicity. And then there are several other signs or symptoms that might be present as well. So clammy or blue lips, nails, or skin, snoring, choking, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, confusion, and even sometimes seizures. And these are just showing some of the common, common opioids to look out for. We've included this chart just to give you a visual idea of how other opioids compare to morphine in terms of potency. And as you can see on the bottom, fentanyl is the most potent at 80 times that of morphine. And then this is just a reminder that the opioid equianalgesic chart should be printed and posted in your pharmacy, such as on the narcotic safe, uh, just as a readily available reference to cross check whenever patients are being switched from one opioid to another. There are several factors that can put certain people at risk 
at greater risk of opioid toxicity. And we can break them down into three categories. So we have high risk opioid use, high risk patient history, and high risk living conditions. So under high risk opioid use, some of these factors include an opioid dose of greater than 50 morphine equivalents per day. Uh, if the patient is using it for longer than one month, if the patient is returning to use or restarting opioid use after uh, cessation, so after stopping it for a while, uh, if they're using a long acting dosage form because it stays in the system longer, and if they're using it along with sedatives such as benzodiazepines or CNS depressants such as alcohol. Uh, under high risk patient history, we have any illicit drug use because Oftentimes, illicit drugs can be laced with uh, strong opioids such as fentanyl, uh, history of substance use disorder or opioid toxicity, recent discharge from prison or rehab, and then other comorbidities such as renal or liver impairment, respiratory disease, or psychiatric disease. And then finally, we have high-risk living conditions, and that includes living in a remote area because they usually don't have um, quick access to resources and supports, as well as children or elderly in the house because they may get their hands on uh, the, some opioids that were intended for someone else in the house. So now we'll talk about naloxone. So there are a few common misconceptions among patients regarding opioid uh, regarding opioids and naloxone, and we'll just take a moment to address some of them. So the first myth we have is naloxone is only for people who have a history of substance misuse. So in fact, naloxone should be recommended to anyone at risk of opioid toxicity. So not just those with a history of substance misuse, since we know that opioid toxicity can really happen to anyone. And we'll also discuss the new guidelines for dispensing naloxone further in a few slides. The second myth is that naloxone encourages more drug use, and that is uh, false. Naloxone does not encourage or increase drug use. The third myth is that naloxone can only be obtained via prescription from a doctor. And uh, the fact is that each province has a free take-home naloxone program in place and no prescription is required. And eligibility in most provinces are actually just based on self-reported risk of toxicity. And the final myth we have here is that naloxone should only be used in confirmed opioid toxicity cases. So naloxone is actually very safe and should even be used when the cause of toxicity hasn't been confirmed because it poses no harm to someone with no opioids in their system. And we'll also discuss that further in the next few slides. Okay. So as we know, naloxone is used in the emergency treatment of a known or suspected op opioid overdose. And it's an opioid antagonist with a stronger affinity for opioid receptors than the actual opioids. So what basically happens is that when there are opioids bound to the receptors, naloxone comes in and kicks off the opioid, taking its place to reverse the opioid toxicity. Naloxone is rapid acting, but only temporary. So it does not replace acute primary care. And it is important to always take the patient to the hospital after administering naloxone. So we'll just go over some of the formulations available in Canada. Uh, we have the injectable solution as well as a nasal spray. So on the left-hand side for the injectable solution, it is, for, it is to be in, um, injected into the muscle. And each vial contains one milliliter of 0 0.4 milligrams of naloxone hydrochloride. Uh, so it should be administered into the deltoid or the outer thigh, and it can be administered through clothing. And we've included a link to an administration video here, which you can access after the webinar once we send the slides out. And the onset of uh, the, the naloxone solution is two to five minutes, and the duration can last anywhere from 30 to 120 minutes. One caveat about the injectable solution is that the patient or whoever administering the 
administering the naloxone has to be comfortable with using needles and being able to withdraw the solution from the vial into the syringe. Uh, so now we have the uh, Narcan nasal spray. So Narcan is the um, brand name. And uh, that is much easier than the solution because it's a single dose. There's no preparation needed. You don't need to prime it. All you have to do is place the nozzle into the nostril and press down on the plunger. And it can be administered while the patient is unconscious. And we've included an administration video there as well. Uh, each um, nasal spray device contains four milligrams of naloxone per 0.1 milliliters. And the dose here that is on, or the onset here that is on the slide of eight to 13 minutes is from Lexicomp and is based on older studies that use significantly lower doses than what is currently used. So they use 0 0.8 to 1.4 milligrams instead of four milligrams. However, the monograph states that the time to max concentration for the four milligram dose is approximately the same as the injectable naloxone, which indicates that the time to onset should be similar. So we'll just note also that um, studies comparing intramuscular versus intranasal naloxone did not find significant differences in clinical response times or adverse event, events rates. So they are equally as safe and as effective. And just to add to that, um, as Marabella already said, the fact that there is the intranasal option makes it a lot easier for patients who are not comfortable with preparing and giving the intramuscular option. And I have a trainer here of the Narcan product, the intranasal product. And you can see, of course, everyone is aware uh, just how easy it is. It is the one dose and it would just be a pump to get uh, the product into the patients. Thanks, Molly. Okay, now we'll go over the safety profile of naloxone. Uh, naloxone is safe for all ages. Acute withdrawal symptoms may sometimes occur, particularly when larger doses of naloxone are given to opioid tolerant patients. And those withdrawal symptoms include agitation, restlessness, sweating, tachycardia, nausea, and vomiting. And naloxone cannot get a person high or intoxicated, nor does it encourage the use of opioids, as mentioned before. Naloxone has no absolute contraindications and it can be used in pregnancy, although we do want to monitor those patients closely. We also want to monitor patients with cardiovascular disease or history of seizures closely. And it's important to note not to use naloxone with other opioid antagonists such as methylnaltrexone, maldemidine, or naloxagol because it can increase the risk of opioid withdrawal. It's important to note that naloxone only works at the opioid receptors specifically. So it has no effect on a person who has no opioids in their system. And that being said, it's always better to administer naloxone even when you're unsure of the cause of toxicity because it will only provide benefit to the patient. So when in doubt, spray don't delay. Naloxone, both the injectable and nasal spray, should always be kept at room temperature, although excursions are permitted up to 24 hours at up to 40 degrees Celsius. They also should be protected from light, and if they do get frozen, you can thaw it by warming it in your hands before using it. Uh, the monograph advises not to leave naloxone in a car on hot summer days or in the winter when it can freeze. But some recent studies have actually shown that both injectable and nasal naloxone exhibited no changes in drug concentration following exposure to heat or freeze thaw cycles for up to 28 days compared to room temperature. So the bottom line here is that if your naloxone is expired or was exposed to extreme temperatures, it should be replaced as soon as possible. But if it's the only naloxone you have on hand in the case of an opioid toxicity emergency, then it can and should still be used. Okay, we have another poll question for you folks. Um, and just as another reminder, these polls are anonymous. Um, they're a way for us to get a sense of the experiences with from everyone around us today. 
Um, so the question is, how often do you recommend naloxone to your patients in your pharmacy? And it's rarely, sometimes, only when a patient asks about it, every time we see an opioid prescription or other. My apologies, I see we did not add the other option onto this poll, but if your answer is other, please share on the chat and we'd love to hear um, some of the reasoning or some examples. Okay, so let's end it there. I'll share. Okay, so as we see here, I think it can be challenging to um, figure out when to integrate that recommendation into the workflow for patients. Um, and that's reflected here and within my own experiences in the pharmacy as well. Um, let's go keep going in this presentation and we'll get to the latest guidelines. Okay, so we have another poll. I'll launch that as well. So in situations then in the past question where you did not recommend naloxone to a patient with an opioid prescription, what was the reason for that? So a variety of reasons that we've included here as options could be time constraints. Uh, maybe we're unsure of how the take-home naloxone program works. Maybe the patient doesn't have risk factors for opioid toxicity. Um, maybe in your particular province, uh, free naloxone isn't available in your pharmacy. Um, maybe the patient did not ask for naloxone or perhaps didn't want naloxone or other. Okay, and we see in the chat, cost barriers as well. It's very important to note, especially in provinces where um, there is less accessibility within pharmacy for the take-home naloxone program. Um, okay, I'll just give a couple of seconds and then we'll end this. Really great participation. Thank you, everyone. Okay, I'll end it now. You can see the results here. So the highest ones are time constraints and patient does not have risk factors for opioid toxicity. We went through the risk factors for opioid toxicity earlier. Um, there are a variety of things that can be quite challenging to identify within patients. Um, and of course, time constraints are always um, an important barrier in most pharmacies. So really great feedback. We'll keep going the presentation and see if we can address some of these um, things. Okay. So we're getting into the updated guidelines on naloxone for pharmacists. Uh, but historically, naloxone dispensing has been based on the presence of known opioid toxicity risk factors, such as high opioid doses, long-term opioid use, or a history of substance use disorder, like we mentioned before. However, risk factors can't often be reliably determined due to polypharmacy and the stigma associated with substance use disorders and illicit drugs. So patients often won't be willing to voluntarily give us that information. That being said, recent Canadian guidelines now recommend offering naloxone to every single patient who is taking an opioid, regardless of the presence of any risk, risk factors. So in the uh, just most recent poll, um, the patient did not have any risk factors was one of the top answers. So now according to the new guidelines, even if the patient doesn't have any risk factors, uh, it is still ideal to recommend naloxone. And we've linked uh, those guidelines down below and you're able to click on that once you get the slides at the end. So as you can see from this, um, from the slide here, the old guidelines, you would flag the prescription screen for risk factors and then recommend naloxone. Whereas with the new guidelines, as soon as you see an opioid prescription, you would recommend naloxone. It really makes things easier from the pharmacy point of view as well, where instead of trying to gather that information and um, being like making sure that we're not um, making patients feel uncomfortable with the conversation um, by asking some of those questions. It's a little bit easier now where if you see an opioid prescription or even um, non-prescribed as well, then you would recommend that naloxone. You know, 
Okay, now we'll go over the provincial coverage of naloxone and the uh, take home naloxone programs. So we've kind of summarized it in this chart here. Uh, each province does have their own take home naloxone program. So in the top row here, you can see that all provinces offer the injectable solution through that program. Um, and Ontario and Quebec also offer the nasal spray in addition to the solution. For most provinces, patients don't need to give any personal information or provide any identification if they wish to remain anonymous. Uh, the exceptions are in Quebec if the person trying to get naloxone is not a Quebec resident, and then also in Saskatchewan. For some, uh, in the third row here, you can see for some provinces, the uh, naloxone distribution site would be required to register for the take home naloxone program in order to participate. So that's Alberta, BC, Manitoba, Nova Scotia, and Saskatchewan. In Ontario and Quebec, no registration is needed. They can just start um, dispensing naloxone and bill it to the government. And then in New Brunswick, Newfoundland, and PEI, uh, pharmacies unfortunately aren't involved in the take home naloxone program. Although naloxone is a Schedule II um, drug, so it can be sold over the counter. And then in the last row here, you can see the remuneration that the pharmacy will get per kit of naloxone that they dispense. So in Alberta, they get up to a $12.30 dispensing fee. Nova Scotia gets a $25 administration fee. Ontario gets a $25 training fee plus a $10 professional fee coming to $35. And then Quebec gets an $18.59 counseling fee plus a dispensing fee of up to $9.64. And uh, I do want to just note that this chart does not include naloxone for purchase, as I mentioned before, and the cost of that varies by province. I'll also note that both formulations of naloxone are available for free for patients under Veteran Affairs Canada, as well as the NIHB program. And in this case, valid identification must be provided in order to confirm their eligibility of, uh, through the program. Okay, now for the most important part of this presentation, what can we as pharmacists do? Okay, another poll question for you all here. Um, I know that I myself have come across situations where it was quite a challenge to get buy-in from the patients. We're definitely curious to hear your experiences. So how often in, do your naloxone recommendations in your practice lead to patient uptake? And just give a few more seconds. Again, this is um, anonymous. Uh, we're very interested in hearing some of your experiences within pharmacy. Um, if you don't see the option that best reflects your practice, feel free to share it in the chat as well. Um, and I'll just give it a few more seconds. Okay, thank you everyone for participating. I'll end it at this point. Okay. So sharing these results now, we can see that, you know, it really differs um, across different experiences. You know, sometimes, most times, rarely we get uh, answers across the board. Uh, very few for every time. <laughs> I think uh, it'll be very A-plus pharmacists who can get every patient um, to accept the naloxone just because of some of the barriers that we have talked about and some of the barriers we'll also discuss um, coming up. Mm -hmm. so thanks so much, everyone. So we will discuss um, how to go over those barriers that you may face when patients are kind of hesitant to um, accept the naloxone in a few slides. Uh, but first we'll talk about some pharmacy interventions that can help increase the uptake of naloxone um, step by step. So the first step is to identify patients. And so that's flagging any opioid prescriptions as well as schedule two opioid purchases. So that includes Tylenol 1s, Mercentol, Camelin. And flagging schedule two opioid purchases isn't specifically included in the guidelines. 
but it doesn't hurt to probe and ask questions about what the patient is using it for, how long they're using it for, et cetera, and then use your professional judgment to decide whether or not to recommend naloxone to that patient. The second step is to make the recommendation of naloxone, and we'll discuss on the next slide how to have that conversation with the patient. And then finally, of course, you want to provide education on opioid toxicity symptoms, safe opioid use, and emergency protocol. So the top barrier in dispensing naloxone is patient stigma and refusal against it, but pharmacists can play a role in reducing this negative perception through a few different ways. So first we want to offer to speak in a private counseling room because some patients might not feel comfortable discussing this topic with other people around. Then you want to explain why you are offering naloxone to this patient and how they can benefit from it. So some things to point out are that it reverses opioid toxicity and is a life-saving antidote. It can help themselves or others in an emergency. It's extremely safe and effective. It's available as either an injectable or intranasal formulation, which is very easy to use. There's no prescription needed, and it's free of charge for most patients under the take-home naloxone program, depending on the formulation and province. To further even convince your patient, you can mention that you yourself always have naloxone on hand in case of any emergency, just like a first aid kit, even though you don't use opioids. We also want to make sure that we give patients the opportunity to ask questions or voice any concerns so that we can address them and maybe demystify some preconceptions they might have to make them feel more comfortable getting naloxone. For patients who have never heard about naloxone, you can print out the patient education form from Lexicon. And there's also the option to print it in different languages for those whose primary language isn't English. And finally, we want to be mindful of our language when, dis when discussing naloxone and opioid toxicity. So as we mentioned before, try to avoid using the word overdose and instead use the terms opioid toxicity or opioid poisoning to reduce stigma. Emphasizing that naloxone is discussed with every patient with an opioid prescription can also help feel the patient feel met, help make the patient feel less targeted. We have a great question in the chat here, Mirabella. Um, if both injectable and nasal naloxone is covered by NIHB and uh, DVA nationally, is the product available everywhere? The chart did say availability of Narcan only in Quebec and Ontario, but is that only where the product is covered by provincial drug plan? Just for clarity. Let's go back to that slide just to make sure that um, we can be clear on here. Yes. So in the top row, it shows the available formulations that are covered under the take-home, like the provincial take-home naloxone program, but the other formulations uh, are available through the NIHB and Veteran Affairs Canada, um, like in those programs separately. And then they're also available to buy over the counter. So for example, say in Alberta, um, you prefer the intranasal solution rather than the injectable. You won't be able to get the intranasal for free if you are if you are, don't qualify under the NIHB or Veteran Affairs, but you can purchase the nasal spray over the counter. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, and these and these programs are constantly evolving as well, um, especially in the past couple of years during uh, COVID. We've seen such a stark need for these programs with the um, mounting opioid crisis. And so they're always adapting. Um, there have been pilots in certain provinces as well that have um, improved accessibility of the uh, intranasal product. Um, so we do anticipate hopefully in the future seeing more of that product being used just because of its benefits that we've already mentioned before in terms of ease of use um, for patients. Mm -hmm. I do see another question. Are patients allowed to have both injectable and nasal, i.e. both can be billed? So each province has their own limit on how many um, naloxone kits the patient can have. So some patients allow for two kits. So if the patient wants two kits, wants one injectable and one nasal, then that's fine. As long as like, for example, uh, 
like it would have to be in Ontario and Quebec to get it for free. There's another great question here. I have a lot of people asking me about keeping this in my car as part of a first aid kit. Any suggestions for these situations where there are extreme temperatures that can be reached in vehicles? Mm -hmm. That is a tough one because of course you want to, like keeping it in the car is one of the easiest solutions to make sure you never forget it. Um, and as mentioned before, uh, the monograph doesn't recommend it, but if it does happen, naloxone has shown to be stable in those conditions for up to 28 days. Um, what I would suggest to try to avoid like keeping it in the car due to extreme temperatures is maybe keeping it in like if like you carry a bag around like a backpack or a purse maybe always keeping it in there because you're also carrying that with you all the time um but yeah that that is a tough one if um you're trying to look for convenience in where to keep your naloxone yeah definitely definitely as Mirabella said a tough situation um where you know it's not particularly recommended, of course, to keep it in those situations where those excursions will occur for long, for long times. Um, potentially, if that's the only way that they'll be, have access to Narcan, then um, you know it's better than not having Narcan uh, or the uh, injectable naloxone. Um, but in provinces where patients can get more than one naloxone kit, for example, maybe it could be. Um, an option where they keep one in the car and also keep one on them as well. And another comment here, I recommend methadone patients to get both kits. They also tell others who come to the pharmacy and get the kits. I also have fire department, uh, the police department and fire department supplied. That is awesome. Making sure your community is protected, um, right. engaging those groups um, and your patients as well. Amazing. Um, and just as a last point for this slide before we move on, this slide is really key because the language that we use and the way in which we position naloxone can make such a big difference for patients who maybe don't understand what naloxone is used for or is on the fence about it. Um, using non-stigmatizing language and making systemic changes to integrate naloxone into the workflow really streamlines, streamlines this process. It makes it easier for our staff uh, for pharmacists and pharmacy teams, and it also makes it more comfortable for our patients. Um, so utilizing the tools that Mirabella talked about before, for example, those uh, patient counseling tools and various languages on Lexicomp, um, other tools and guidelines. The guidelines have a really great conversational algorithm, which you can look at as well. Um, and from Whole Health Send, we've created several tools as well to help improve access and uptake of naloxone through education and counseling. Another question here, would a small cooler slash cooler bag protect it in the vehicle? Um, I think that's a good question. They, I think it would vary um, depending on the circumstances because you know if you're in the car every day and you bring it in the cooler to keep it um, in the car while you're out of, outside of the car, then potentially, but if the cooler is within the car the entire time, then I, I, I think it would still be at risk of those excursions. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll continue on. Uh, so on this slide, we've just included some conversation prompts that might help when you're unsure of how to bring up the topic of naloxone with patients. And I won't read through them all, but these will be available to you after when we send out these slides. So this chart was taken from the Canadian Guidelines for Naloxone Prescribing, which we've linked down below. And it provides an algorithm or script on how to approach how to approach patients depending on their response to the naloxone recommendation you make. So whether they're interested in getting naloxone, if they're hesitant about it, or if they're not interested at all. And again, this will be available to you afterwards. Okay. We have a great question here as well. So um, the question says, I'm in Saskatchewan. How can I get the kit slash spray covered for non-NIHB coverage patients? And so let's go back. Oops go back to the chart that we had here. 
just as a review. So as we see here um, in Saskatchewan, there are certain um, uh, organizations that are involved with uh, providing naloxone. So the Saskatchewan Health Authority is one is is what runs the take home naloxone program. So if you look online there, there's a list of sites where take home naloxone is available to patients. Um, and for there, it is only the injectable product that would be available for free under the take home naloxone product, under the take home naloxone program. If the patient did want the spray instead, um, then it would, they would have to pay uh, potentially from your pharmacy. Um, Potentially, there could be third-party coverage as well, uh, which you can review with them. Oops. Perfect. <laughs> okay. So we've included here some key counseling points that we always want to go over with the patient. The first here we have is safe opioid use. So regardless if the patient takes naloxone or not, we want to counsel every patient with an opioid prescription on safe opioid use. So that includes avoid taking it with alcohol or other sedatives such as benzodiazepines, avoiding tasks that require mental alertness such as driving or operating heavy machinery, uh, measuring liquids with a calibrated syringe instead of a household teaspoon for a more accurate dose, and avoiding abrupt discontinuation to minimize risk of withdrawal symptoms. We also, of course, want to counsel on how to recognize the signs and symptoms of opioid toxicity and how to administer the naloxone in the formulation that they get. We'll also counsel on emergency protocol, which we'll go over on the next slide. And we want to make sure that they educate their close family and friends in case they're in a situation where they're not able to administer naloxone themselves. And then finally, we want to educate them on how to properly store naloxone and when to replace it, as well as opioid disposal. So making sure that they bring back any unused or expired opioids to the pharmacy instead of um, just throwing it out at home where it might be accessed by someone else. And we have included a link at the bottom here from a safe medication disposal program um, where um, patients can find a location where they can drop off um, drop off their opioids or any other medication for that matter. Okay, so we'll go over our opioid toxicity protocol now, but the main thing that we want to get across is that naloxone should be administered even if you're unsure of the cause of the symptoms or toxicity agent, as we've mentioned before. So first thing you'll do is assess the ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation, as well as the mental status and the skin. So if you remember before, some of the other symptoms of opioid toxicity include dizziness and confusion, and also clammy or blue skin. We also want to try to arouse the patient, so by shouting their name, giving them a little shake, and if they're unresponsive, then call 911. If they're not breathing, you also want to administer CPR and rescue breathing, and then you'll administer the naloxone. And then after three to five minutes, if they don't respond to the first dose, you can administer a second dose. You also wanna make sure that they go to the hospital, even if they do respond to any of the naloxone doses, because naloxone does not replace acute care. Uh, some of the important points we have here in this box uh, naloxone is specific to opioids and will not reverse toxicity from other drugs. Um, the just note that we want to make here is that in the case of any illicit drug toxicities, naloxone should still be administered because of that common presence of opioids laced into them. And then the second point we have here is that the effects of naloxone may start to wear off after 30 minutes and toxicity symptoms can reoccur. So it's important to continue to monitor the patient for at least four hours after the last dose of naloxone. And that's also why it's so important to get the patient to the hospital. Some people might be hesitant to call for help when experiencing opioid toxicity in fear of getting in trouble for possessing opioids on hand. 
but we can reassure them that reporting a case of opioid toxicity won't get them into trouble due to the Good Samaritan Act. So this act provides legal protection against charges for possession of a con controlled substance and breach of conditions regarding simple possession of controlled substances. This act not only applies to the person experiencing an overdose, but also anyone who helps seek emergency help and anyone who remains at the scene when help arrives. We have a really great question here. What's the max dose of naloxone? Um, so in terms of answering that question, so generally the recommendation um, is for the first dose and then the second dose as a backup. Uh, often that's what's required before the patient uh, is, um, goes to acute care. How far apart, we'll get to that uh, very shortly in just a couple of slides. The third dose is sometimes supplied for situations where um, you know waiting for EMS is prolonged, maybe you're on the call, the phone with um, the paramedics in 911, and they recommend the third dose. In terms of toxicity data, naloxone is very safe. There has been data where it has been shown even very high doses um, to be safe um, for patients. Uh, in terms of the how far apart, it should be three to five minutes because that's what the onset of naloxone is. So if after three to five minutes, the patient isn't responding, then you can administer the second dose. Okay. So as mentioned before, stigma is the top reason why many patients refuse naloxone. Misinformation also plays a large role, as well as perceived cost and the time taken to counsel the patient about naloxone and how to use it. So all of these barriers are things that pharmacists can address and have a significant impact on in order to increase patient uptake of naloxone. Yeah, so just to add to this as well, um, we touched on these barriers so far in the presentation, but it's very key for pharmacists to address these for their patients and within our own teams as well. For stigma, it's about the type of language that we use, which we talk about in terms of opioid overdose versus opioid toxicity, and making sure that we recommend nar nar naloxone to every patient taking an opioid. For misinformation, it's the education piece and providing resources to patients who maybe aren't sure or aren't aware of the benefits of naloxone. For the cost piece, again, there are certain provinces where naloxone may not be free in pharmacy. It's important in those provinces to be aware of where patients can access it, if not available in your pharmacy. Um, and for the time piece, of course, very important for all aspects of pharmacy. I think this relates to each one of the previous barriers before. So if the topic around naloxone is addressed in a way that's non-stigmatizing, if there are resources that are easier to access for patients of the pharmacy teams, and if it's implemented in a way um, where it's systemic and in integrated into the workflow, all of those factors will contribute to facilitating that recommendation. So we do have a last poll question that we'd like to get your feedback on. Again, this is all anonymous. At which point in the pharmacy workflow do you intervene to make a naloxone recommendation? So do you recommend naloxone at drop-off? Is it at pickup? Um, is it when patients are refilling their prescriptions? Um, do you perhaps contact patients proactively or is it something other than that? Are you able to see the poll, Marabella? Yes, I can see it. Okay. I think I'm just going to relaunch it because I think there are some issues here. Oh, no poll. Okay. Launching, continue. Okay. Can, okay, I think it's working now. Perfect. Yeah. We'll just give it a few seconds. Um, I think generally, what has been your experience, Mirabella, in uh, when naloxone is usually recommended? Definitely usually during pickup because 
usually at drop off, um, the tech kind of takes care of drop off and pickup is when the pharmacist counsels the patient. So um, that's where I typically see it. Like the, the pharmacist is already speaking to the patient there. So that's usually when they bring that up. Yeah, I agree with you. That's what I've seen in practice as well. Often pickup is where there's more interaction with the pharmacist. Um, and so that's usually where, when it happens. But let's see what um, the group says here. So I'll end it. And as you can see with the results, exactly what we were mentioning, that pickup is the most common uh, time when the recommendation is made. And then it's kind of uh, a mix of the three other options with some pharmacists even contacting patients proactively, which is awesome. Um, perhaps going through their files, um, generating lists of patients who take opioids, um, yeah, to, to make that recommendation too. That's great. So here's a timeline of opportunities for invention, intervention in the pharmacy workflow. So I know a lot of you um, said that you make the intervention at pickup, but we'll kind of discuss why drop-off is actually the most ideal spot. So the first thing I do want to mention is that the pharmacist is the leader of the team. So before even getting into this um, timeline here, it might be worthwhile to start conversations with your own team members about their preconceptions about opioids and naloxone to help address any stigma that exists in your own pharmacy first. So that means educating them about who is at risk for opioid toxicity and training them to flag all opioid prescriptions that drop off as well. And then if your team is comfortable, then you can encourage them to initiate conversations about naloxone with the patient but if not, then they can just leave a note on the patient's file for the pharmacist. Uh, I know also there's an option to add pop-up notes to drug profiles on Kroll. So you could also add a note on um, the opioids profiles that remind you to ask the patient about naloxone when it's being dispensed. So like I said, uh, the best it's best to make the intervention at drop-off rather than pickup because the rest of the pharmacy team can start to work on filling their prescription while you discuss naloxone with them rather than asking them to stay a few extra minutes at pickup. As we all know, patients are often in a rush to go home when they come to pick up their medications, so starting the intervention there might not be as effective. So going through the workflow at drop-off, uh, after we flag the opioid prescription, we will make the recommendation for naloxone and also address any questions and concerns uh, while implementing those uh, techniques that we've mentioned before on how to have that conversation with the patient. When the patient comes to pick up their prescription, you can counsel on opioid safety as well as naloxone use and emergency protocol. And then at follow-up, so according to the guidelines, they say three months after dispensing, or um, whenever you see the patient next, as well as annually. And you can also follow up during meds checks. So if you see that the patient is on multiple opioids or, or any opioid for that matter, um, then you can follow up with them and then also remind them to check the expiry date. And then finally, when the patient does come in for a refill, you can review the emergency protocol with them. And then we just have a final note here uh, to not forget to look out for Schedule two opioid purchases as well. Oh, Molly, you're muted. <laughs> Thanks, Mirabella. It's always hard to work with Zoom sometimes, um, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to make a quick note before we go into the next few slides, which we'll just go over some of the tools that we've made for the campaign. Um, it's so important for pharmacists to participate in this sort of initiative where it's such an important public health initiative. We know the opioid crisis is very, very prevalent, especially um, in the wake of COVID. And we do have products that are available within our pharmacies um, to help prevent opioid related deaths. So of course we have the injectable and the intranasal option. Unfortunately, intranasal is not available for free in every single pharmacy, um, and often there is limited third-party coverage for it. And so in those provinces um, where it might not be available, 
um, you know, making the right recommendation for the patient based on their preferences and their price point as well. So I just want to thank everyone for participating today. You've been amazing. I think we've touched on some very important questions and um, phenomena that happens in pharmacy around naloxone. Uh, I just want to go over these next few slides quickly to just review some of the tools that we've created for our naloxone program. If you would like to learn more about our materials and about our banner, please reach out. My email is at the end of this presentation. Um, there's also a survey link that I put in the chat. Um, and just as a last note, if you haven't already, please follow us on our social media to keep up to date with our programs and resources. Um, thank you again to everyone for your participation. If you have any questions, uh, Mirabella and I will stay on for the next few minutes. Um, okay, so for from Olivia, for short-term use of opioids for acute pain, do you find people respond well to naloxone recommendations? I often see short-term opioids, Percocet or one milligram hydromorphone, and am hesitant to recommend naloxone. I think this is a really great question because we often see these prescriptions and um, perhaps more common than some of the chronic opioid prescriptions that we do see. I think the important part here that is emphasized by the guidelines is that naloxone, you know, it's, it's available, it's for free for uh, everyone essentially from the take home naloxone program, and it's extremely safe. Um, so it's just about approaching it in a way um, that reduces stigma and reduces any discomfort from the pharmacist's point of view and also the patient's. So I do, I do think that it is uh, right to recommend naloxone in these cases and just maybe angling it in a way where you say, you know, everyone who comes in with a prescription for this type of medications gets this. Um, you can make an analogy to epinephrine injectors, for example, where you know, this is in, in case of emergency where you use it and it could potentially save your life. It could potentially save the life of someone you love in your home. Um, you can also, you know, approach it in a way where you say, as a pharmacist, I always carry naloxone just in case I see a situation where I can help someone else, right? So there's various ways where you can, um, you can talk to patients about it to make it feel less targeted um, because of that particular prescription. Just going off of that, I find with short-term um, opioids, like for temporary or acute pain, I feel like um, with those, oftentimes patients actually don't finish all of the opioids in the bottle. So I know when I got my wisdom teeth out, I got um, uh, some Tylenol with codeine and I didn't finish it all. So it was sitting on my desk for maybe about a month before I returned it to the pharmacy. So that's also a hazard in the home as well. So kind of emphasizing that, um, especially if there's children or elderly in the house, that could be a risk. Yeah. We had a good question. Um, in Ontario, where can I acquire the kits and regarding billing to Ontario? How is that done? So you can order the kits from your wholesaler um, and regarding billing, there is a, an executor, executive officer notice for that as well. There are various pins that uh, for each individual product that you have to put in during the billing process. I see some questions that were asked during the presentation that I guess I just missed. So with respect to the number of deaths related to prescription opioids, is this number reflective of legitimate versus non-legitimate use, i.e. someone using their own prescription versus someone using a script not pre prescribed for them? So um, I'm assuming they're talking about the 17 uh, deaths per day. And that was from the Government of Canada website based on one of the surveys they did. And I don't think it could, um, differentiate between those two, like if someone was using their own prescription or someone else's, it was just the total, yeah, the total deaths. And Molly's uh, sent the link in the, oh no, that's a different link. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, that was the link for the executive officer notice um, for Ontario. Mm -hmm. And then another question here was, does it make sense to offer naloxone to someone on suboxone treatment. So maybe Molly, I'll pass that to you. <laughs> yeah, so I think in these situations where, um, I think the overall 
stance of the guidelines and where we are with naloxone now is that it shouldn't be used so judiciously and we should be comfortable with recommending it in situations where a patient um, could be either at risk of opioid toxicity or if they could potentially um, observe someone else uh, experiencing opioid toxicity. So in this, those situations, I think it's completely valid to offer it to patients. Um, you can ask them if they'd be open to hearing about it, um, you know, because if they then perhaps they themselves are on suboxone therapy and are controlled, but maybe there are those around them that could benefit from having uh, a naloxone kit somewhere um, near them in their home, for example. So I think overall, um, <laughs> if the question is whether or not to provide naloxone to a patient that you're not sure of whether or not to give it to, my answer for most 99% of situations would be yes. And another question in the chat, as a Samaritan, how to identify if someone is on opioid toxicity? So I think it's really a public health initiative that um, everyone should be aware of how to identify opioid toxicity, especially the opioid toxicity triad. So slowed breathing, pinpoint pupils, and decreased consciousness. Um, so, of course, if you see those three symptoms, and even if you're not sure if it's naloxone, as we kept on emphasizing during the presentation, spray, don't delay. It won't do any harm to someone who is not on opioids. And if they end up being on opioids, then you're only providing benefit. So I think it is like a public health measure to kind of increase education around opioid toxicity and how to identify it and how to use naloxone and that kind of thing. But um, for now, like we can do our part and we can also educate those around us. Definitely. Hey, if that is all the questions, um, I just wanna say thank you again to everyone for tuning in. Thank you also to Mirabella who uh, presented very well this evening um, and also did such amazing work on this program and her entire time at Whole Health. Um, and if anybody has any follow-up questions, please feel free to email me and please also fill out our uh, feedback form that's linked in the chat.